Amen. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Again, I want to thank everybody uh, that helped and uh, uh, hopped in, and uh, especially the medical team, those who went and opened doors and flagged down ambulance. I think they were testing his vitals, and he was deciding whether he was going to go to the hospital or not. So uh, prayerfully, um, uh, prayerfully, it was just blood sugar um, and, uh, and nothing else, but uh, he had Open heart surgery has a bad, very, very bad heart, so that was the major concern, and it still may be that, we don't know, uh, but he was sitting up talking and doing, doing, doing well, so uh, we're very, very thankful for that. Second Corinthians chapter number 5. You know, I was sitting there thinking as Leslie was singing, imagine being Brother Bob and sitting out there and uh, hearing, <laughs> hearing somebody singing, uh, somebody's praying for you. It couldn't have been more appropriate, couldn't it? Uh, and uh, I don't put together the order of service. Uh, the Holy Spirit does. And so we're thankful for that. And uh, thank you, Leslie, for that beautiful song and how appropriate uh, that, uh, that that was. Second Corinthians chapter number 5. And uh, we're going to be looking, and the title of my message is this, A New Mission. A New Mission. Um, how, how many of you have been on a, a mission trip before? You say, Pastor... This has nothing to do with me. I'm not even going on the mission trip, so I'm off this week. I don't have to worry about the Holy Spirit getting me. <laughs> hey, I want us to approach this in a specific way. This trip is more than a trip. This is the heartbeat of our church. And more than the heartbeat of our church, missions is the heartbeat of God. Hey, and not every one of us is going, but every one of us ought to be praying. And not every one of us is going, but every one of us ought to be giving. And not every one of us is going, but every one of us ought to examine our hearts and lives this morning and say, God, what greater part do you have for me in your mission, the Great Commission? You say, Pastor, a new mission. How can the Great Commission be new? Because my prayer is this. That not only for those who are going to Sierra Leone, but for those who will be here, that God would use the preaching of God's word this morning to rekindle in us a new heart, a new passion, a new desire, a renewed joy and excitement for missions. Missions is not just something that we do. Missions is what we do. And whether it's here in Batavia or whether it's in Sierra Leone, this is what the Batavia Baptist Temple is about, reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here we find a foundational passage, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth about what it means now that you've been saved, what is our involvement in reaching others and in the mission. You see, what we find out is that when we get saved, a lot of things change and a lot of things that we didn't even realize or understand we're going to. We're going to look at some things in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And most of the time we stop there and we say amen, right? But you know this passage keeps going. There's more that here in here. Verse number 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us. Now, first it was the ministry of reconciliation. Now it's the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. A new mission. I remember when I went on my first missions trip, I was 15 years old. Since then, the Lord's given me the opportunity to travel all over the world to preach the gospel. In more than 40 countries. But you know, the most impactful for me was my first time. I was 15 years old, and I was going to Juarez, Mexico. Now, Juarez, Mexico then wasn't near as bad as Juarez, Mexico <laughs> is now since then i probably went into war as mexico uh, at times that i shouldn't have gone into war as mexico but i'll never forget looking people in the eyes that speak a different language than i do 
skin was a different tone than mine was. That lived in a, a different culture than I lived in. And I was not only impacted as a young person by the idea and the reminder that God has blessed me by putting me in this great nation and in a great home and in a great church. And all those things were true. But to realize that I had the truth of the gospel readily available since I was a, a child, heard the preaching of God's word, what it means to be saved, what it means to put our, our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, for many who are going this week, this is going to be a new experience. It's going to be something different than what they have gone through before. Some have traveled out of the country, but maybe never on a mission trip. Here we find some grassroots truths. That are at the core of missions and at the heartbeat of God and ought to be at the heartbeat of our church and should be the heartbeat of each of us as Christians. The first thing we see is a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Are you thankful that you're a new creation? Amen. The foundation of our mission is that we are a new creation in Christ. The old life of sin and living for ourselves and our own lusts and our own desire and fulfilling what's right in our own hearts and what we think for ourselves is, are gone. We should realize we're not any longer defined by who we are but by who Christ is. And that doesn't only change our eternity but it changes our now. It doesn't change what we do when eternity starts it changes what we do starting right now from the time of salvation. We're a new creature. The foundational propelling force behind missions is that our heart and lives are changed and we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Him. Uh, hey, if it wasn't for salvation, you know who I'd live for? This guy. I'm saved and sometimes I still live for this guy. That's the battle that I face every day. The Apostle Paul said that every day we've got to take off the old man and we've got to put on the what? The new man. That's what we're talking about, a new mission. Hey, if you're saved, you no longer live for yourself. You're a child of God, and the heartbeat of your life ought to be to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether it's in Batavia, Sierra Leone, Papua New Guinea, Australia, Asia, Africa, doesn't matter. We ought to preach the gospel to every person that God would give us the opportunity to do so. You see, we have a new identity in Christ. We used to be a slave. We used to be bound. But our new identity is not found in who we used to be, but our new identity is found in the person of Jesus Christ. We're no longer a slave, but we're a son. We're no longer captive, but we're now free. Boy, there's a lot of power in that thought. We used to be a captive slave. Now we're a free son. Two very different ideas. At completely different ends of the spectrum. We're a new creation. It ought to be a propelling force for us in our lives in the area of missions. We have a new purpose. We're not called to live for ourselves, but we're called to live for God's glory. Hey, if you're saved, your priorities change. If you're saved, your mission changes. If you're saved, your goals change. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, everything is transformed. As a new creation, we're equipped to fulfill the purpose that he's designed for our lives. Not the goals, dreams, and wishes that we've set forth for ourselves. To be a new creature, a new creation, helps us to remember and understand the purpose that we've been given for salvation, for missions, for reaching the world. Verse number 18, not only do you see a new creation, but we see a new ministry. He says, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. When Paul here says that all things are of God, hey, in a general sense, is that true? Or all things of God? If you believe that, say amen. amen. But here he's speaking in a specific context. And the truth that he's relaying is this. Hey, what I'm saying is from God. He's saying, hey, these things are the truths of God. These aren't what Paul has to say. 
This isn't, what the, this isn't what the Apostle Paul is saying. This isn't what Pastor Phil has to say. This is what God has to say. He establishes a distinct authority regarding what he's about to say. Hey, this morning, I'm not preaching to you my own truth, but I'm preaching to you that which is of God. He says that he has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. If you're saved, that's true. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're a new creature, but we have a new ministry. The definition of reconciliation is the restoration of a broken relationship. Sin separated mankind from God. Christ died to restore that relationship. That's what reconciliation is. He says this is a ministry that he's given to us. Hey, if we've experienced reconciliation, we ought to be about seeing others reconciled. Reconciliation is a broken relationship. Have you ever been in a relationship that was broken, that needed mended, that needed healed, that needed reconciliation? Oftentimes there's a lot of posturing. Oftentimes there's someone who feels they need to be right. Often we think that it has to be on our terms. Hey, the Bible gives, and my message isn't about this, gives clear direction about reconciliation and what it looks like. It, it, puts the, it, it puts the responsibility on the believer that no matter if they were offending or offended to reconcile the relationship. Right? Hey, isn't that what Christ did for us? Reconciled us to God by any means necessary? We've been reconciled. We've been brought back together. The relationship between uh, that Adam and Eve had as they, as they walked in a pure sense, in true fellowship like no one has ever known with God in the Garden of Eden. Could you imagine? They were, they, they were created as righteous, sinless beings. But they were created with a free will. They had perfect fellowship with God. It was broken because of sin. Now all of us live in a sinful flesh because of the result of that original sin. For as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all for that all have sinned. And God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Hey, what would you give up to reconcile the relationship? Money? Probably not. Time? Most people would say yes, but how often do we? Humility? That's a tough one to swallow. We'd rather live in bitterness rejection instead of reconciliation God loved us so much that he gave his only son to reconcile us to himself how many of you have children who, who are you giving that child up for that's the ministry that he's given to us is this ministry of reconciliation to see others? Does it mean that we can reconcile? So can I rec- can I reconcile Michael Coleman to God? No, but Jesus Christ can. I can tell him about Jesus Christ and that he can be reconciled to God. We're praying he'll eventually do that. <laughs> Not only a new ministry, but a new message. Look at verse number nineteen. It says, "To wit, that God was in Christ." reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What's the difference between the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation? First, we're given the ministry, we're given the assignment, we're given the task to help others be reconciled to God, but now we're given the avenue, the means by which they're reconciled. Hey, they're not reconciled because of the great sermon from Pastor Phil. I can assure you of that. If you go out with Brother Eddie on Saturdays at 11 o'clock and share the gospel with people, hey, no one is going to come to Christ because you eloquently presented the gospel. 
They're going to come because they're going to get saved. They're going to come to God in faith because they trust the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the word of reconciliation. The power is not in, the, is not in our ability, but it's in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto, the, unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and to all who call upon his name. We have a new message. Hey, we like to, we like to preach a lot of messages, don't we? We like to talk about a lot of things. Why don't we talk more about the gospel? Grandparents, they love to preach about their grandkids. And there is nothing wrong with that. You say, preach, what do you mean? Pre preach means to proclaim, to tell others about, to... Hey, things that we enjoy, things that we like, we don't have any problem preaching them. We don't struggle to preach about our favorite football team. We don't struggle to, to preach about relationships or those in our lives that we love, but why do we have such a difficult time preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's the message as new creatures that we've been given. It tells us that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself you say pastor phil what does that mean i don't think we can understand what that means that god was in christ hey the act was the death of christ upon the cross of calvary and although god turns his back on him there was a moment in time a moment in history when before he died on that cross the sin of all mankind was put upon the savior as he hung suspended between heaven and earth, what a beautiful picture we have. The mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, elevated above the earth between God and man, the ultimate sacrifice, one and for all, to pay for our sins. And yes, it was the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary, but it was the sacrifice of God himself that gave his son to die on the cross of Calvary. The book of Isaiah says this, it says it pleased him to bruise him did he find pleasure in the torment and the torture of his son no but he found pleasure in the reconciliation that was the result of the torture and torment of his son as he hung on the cross of calvary that's the message that the world needs that's what Sierra Leone needs. Listen, the first time I went to Sierra Leone, there was people dying in the streets from the Ebola virus. We drove down the road and there was camps, you probably saw it on the news, where they were taking these people and isolating them. We would drive into cities and there'd be a rope that was stretched across the road. And they'd take your temperature and they'd make you wash your hands before you could even enter in. They were scared to death of Ebola. Hey, they ought to have been scared to death of dying and going to hell for all of eternity without the truth of the gospel. We see in verse number 20, new creation, a new ministry, a new message, and we see a new position. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, that ye be reconciled to God. It says that we are ambassadors. When we get saved, we get a new position. We've been in foreign countries have met with dignitaries, ambassadors, politicians. You can typically tell by the way they carry themselves, they think themselves to be something. The reality is this. We have a great position. Not one that ought to puff us up, but one that ought to humble us. You can see my notes. I scratched out several points here. I started with a new ambassadorship, but I had a hard time saying ambassadorship, so I decided that I would go with a new position. That's the position that we have, to be an ambassador. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is someone that represents somebody else. Hey, in missions, when you give your money in the plate to worldwide missions, it's not a representation of yourself. We're representing Christ. We go on somebody else's behalf. An ambassador in our modern culture is someone who goes from another country to represent that country someplace else.
That's a big responsibility. Could you imagine the weight that would be associated with being an ambassador? To speak on behalf of, to stand in the stead of some of the most powerful men and women in the world? To represent Christ's kingdom is even a greater calling. As ambassadors, we're not sent to represent a a nation of this earth, but we're sent as citizens of that great city of heaven to represent our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, You know what else we see here, though? Look in verse number 20. Verse number 20, we're going to see a new urgency. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. What does it say? As though God did beseech you by us. What does that word beseech mean? It means to beg, to plead. Here the Apostle Paul says the urgency is this. In this ministry of reconciliation, that's the preaching of the word of reconciliation. The preaching of the gospel. He said, when I preach it, in church at Corinth, when you preach it, there's such an urgency within me that it's like God is pleading through me to you to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that the type of urgency we have when we share the gospel? That we're an ambassador? That we're speaking for God? That we're speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ? That we're representing His glorious kingdom? That we're sharing His gospel, His work, His reconciliation, His love, His judgment, and not our own? Do we look and think, God is using me as a vessel and through me, He wants to beg other people to come to faith and trust in Him. He wants to plead with other people. He wants to beseech other people. And the vessel that He wants to use is me. Is that not what this verse is saying? Is that not what the Apostle Paul was saying? That God was in Him, in them, in preaching the gospel. Hey, think about this. Consider this. What avenue... Could God have used to preach the gospel? Hey, if he wanted to, could he have wrote it in the clouds for the whole world to see? Hey, in the Old Testament, he sent angels to be his messengers. Think of the ones that went to Abraham. Could he have sent an angel to come down and personally tell every one of us, George, the gospel? Could he have chosen that avenue to beg and plead others to accept the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? There's no limit. Hey, in the Old Testament, what else did he do? He spoke himself to people. He he appeared to Moses in the burning bush. How many of you would like to have a burning bush when you're trying to decide what God's trying to tell you to do? It'd be nice. I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, wouldn't it be great if like our specific issue was listed in the Bible? We say, oh, there's the answer right there. The truth is, it's not. (coughs) God could choose any avenue that he desired to share the gospel. You know what avenue he chose? He chose you. He said, the most powerful witness to the reconciling power of the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ would be this. If my creation of its own free will were reconciled and from and out of that firsthand experience and first person account, they had been so changed and transformed as new creatures that they could not help but tell other people that the same could happen for them. God said, That's the most powerful way to share the gospel. More powerful than to put it in the clouds. More powerful than to send an angel. What if my creation of its own free will would tell? You know, the same problem in missions is the same problem in the garden. The free will in the flesh of man. The enemy, Satan, that says you can't do it. 
God can't use you. Let somebody else do it. Anybody ever play recess when you were at school? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Did you have recess when you were at school? You asked me several of them didn't have recess. I think the ones that didn't raise their hand actually predated recess. <laughs> if, you, if you had recess, raise your hand. If you had recess. Did you ever play a, a game in recess? Did you ever pick teams <clears throat> in recess. There was always that one. He was bigger than the rest. He was stronger than the rest. She was the fastest, most athletic. And what'd they say? That's the one that can make the difference. I'm picking them first. When God looked at all of his creation, He looked at his church, and he looked at you. And when it came time to pick who he wanted to share the gospel, he picked you first. He said, I want you. Hey, and it wasn't the biggest, and it wasn't the strongest, and it wasn't the most capable, but it was his creation that had been changed by that same gospel he desired for them to preach. Think of David, the one that was chosen of God, was the most unlikely. Hey, in this new mission that's going to be renewed in our hearts today, God wants to use you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one's looking around. We talked about this new, we didn't get to my last two points. We talked about the new righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. As for he hath made us to be, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That reconciliation brings us back into righteousness and into a relationship with Christ. I ask you a few questions. I have to say, Pastor Phil, I, I've been made righteous. I've been reconciled. I've put my faith and trust in the gospel. I know that I'm saved. There's no doubt about it. Let's you lift your hand up. I know that I know Christ is my Savior. Many hands are up. I say, Pastor Phil, I don't know that I've made that decision. I don't know that I'm a new creature. I, I don't know that I've put my faith and trust in Christ. If I were to die today, I don't know that I'd spend eternity in heaven, but I'm certain that I don't want to spend it in hell. I say, I don't know Christ as my Savior. If that's you, lift your hand up. I don't know that I know Christ as my Savior. If that's you. The okay, Bible says that today is the day of salvation. I would say, Pastor Phil, God spoke to me, convicted me in some way about this new mission, this new urgency this new ministry, this new word that as a, a believer I could not have experienced, as an unbeliever before I could not have experienced, but that I'm responsible to preach the gospel. The Spirit of God spoke to you in some way in this area of missions this morning. If that's you, lift your hand up. God spoke to your heart. I challenge you, if God's spoken to your heart, you take some time and come to the altar this morning and do business with Him. Lord, I, I pray that you do only the work that you can in hearts and lives. Through the Spirit of God. I ask these things in the name of Jesus, I pray. And I love you, Lord. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing a song of invitation. Some are already coming. If God spoke in your heart, don't hesitate, don't wait. Why don't you come now while we sing? Have I no
Easter today, whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence, um, going to continue to play. We're going to remain in an attitude of prayer. You be in prayer for, for Brother Bob and be in prayer for those who are getting ready to leave. And you know, Church, what I said is really what my heart is. This wouldn't just be something for the nine who are going, but it would be something for all of us. Church, would you commit to pray, to remember, to be engaged throughout this week, to think of those who are there on the other side of the world? serving God in that capacity, being obedient to Him. Do you believe that prayer is powerful? Do you believe it's effective? Do you think and believe and know that it can make a difference? Then I'd ask you to commit to, to pray. Here in just a moment, I'm going to ask everybody that's going to Sierra Leone to come up and gather in the front here, and we're going to have a, a word of prayer for them. As a matter of fact, let's, let's do that now. If you're going to Sierra Leone, come up and join me uh, up here on the, on the platform. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, ask, uh, I'm going to ask Brother Randy if he'd come and grab the... Uh, Brother Randy Daniel, come and, and grab uh, the red mic over here. He's going to pray for all of us. Come on, gather around right here. And uh, here's what I'm going to ask. As we pray, I'm going to open up the altar right now. Why don't you, if you'd like to come... And I'm going to ask that we pray together for those who are going on the trip while Brother Randy prays for all of us. So come now if you want to come. Come gather around the altar. Gather around the flags uh, here. Uh, if God, not everyone can come. I understand that. If you cannot, uh, that's, that's all right. But come now if you want to pray, if you want to be a part of this. Gather around the altar. Gather behind those who are at the altar. Uh, come around, kneel here in the front. And uh, when everybody's done uh, coming, and again, we understand not everybody can, uh, but uh, Brother Randy's going to lead us all in prayer. There's plenty of room along the front right here, too, if someone to come down this way. Come on in from the sides around to the front right here. Our Father in heaven, Lord, again, we come to you and thank you for the privilege you've given us to call upon your name in prayer and Lord, what a wonderful opportunity it is to see another group now that's going to be leaving to go to the field and represent our church. Uh, Father, I ask that you would uh, continue to prepare them even now and keep them safe as they travel, Lord, and there not be any delays in the accommodations, but Lord, also they'll have an effective time where they're on the field. Uh, Lord, I think about the ones that will hear pastor preach and other ones as they minister. Lord, I ask you to prepare those hearts even now. Uh, Lord, what an awesome responsibility that we have, to, as pastors reminded us, to share the reconciliation of what you've done in our lives. And Father, I ask that you would help us that are here that remain, that you'd help us to be faithful, to pray for those that are gone. And uh, Father, I ask you would work in our hearts and our lives in a fashion as only you can as we stand unified uh, in this mission and this project. Father, again, I ask that you will be accomplished on the trip, be accomplished in the lives of those that go and those that will be spoken to and preached to, but, Lord, even that your will be accomplished in our lives here as we pray for them. Thank you again, Father, for loving us first and sending Christ to die for us and giving us this gift that we can share. In your name I pray, amen.
Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Hey, we're going to be dismissed this morning. And uh, not, actually, we're not. We're going to have our offering. Go back to your seats. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have been asking this question. When are our new church directories coming? They should be here in the next couple of weeks. And possibly, possibly even while we're gone, they will get here. Uh, so they are coming. I'm going to ask our men to come ahead forward. Be prepared. Feel like a Catholic church today, up and down, up and down. But uh, if I make their, we're going to receive our offering. After the offering, um, we'll be dismissed. We won't have our, our chorus. A couple things. If you are going to Sierra Leone, we're going to meet for three minutes in my office after the service. That's number one. Okay. Number two, don't forget to check out the new property. When you pull out, turn to your right and uh, go down right before the railroad trestle on the right. You can see a piece of property there. It's been cleared. It's a one-acre lot that actually extends across the street over to the uh, riverfront there uh, as well. And uh, look at that, and that's uh, what we'll be voting on on the 16th, Wednesday the 16th. And if you have any questions about that, um, uh, feel free to ask me, and I'd be glad to uh, answer those uh, for you. All right? And I'm going to ask... Uh, Brother Bill Thomas, he wouldn't mind to lift up his voice from where he's at and have a word of prayer for our offering. Thank you, Father, for this church. Thank you, Lord, for those that are in the call to go to the field. I pray that those of us that are not on the field pray about the future going to the field. Lord, thank you for this offering. Let's please pray that it uh, be used to fill your needs, Lord, and we think of you first. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.